I'm going to pray quietly and then go into corporate prayer and then we'll jump right into the message for today. Merciful Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for bringing us here. We thank you for helping us to understand the urgency of where we're at in time. We ask, Lord, that the message cuts to our heart and we understand where we're at and what we need to do. In Jesus' name, amen. So, this week, I got a call. I want to say it was Wednesday. And it was from a gentleman from Tennessee by the name of Lucas. And... Lucas was interviewing me for a job, and somehow or another in the conversation, in the interview for the job, we started to talk about the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> and so, I'm talking to Lucas, a little bit, um, you could drop my volume just a little bit, it feels like it's booming a little bit. Um, so I'm talking to Lucas, and I asked Lucas the question, do you think Jesus is coming back again? On an interview. <laughs> and Lucas stuttered a little bit. And he was like, yeah, um, but I'm not sure when. And so for those who come to the Bible marking class, we did an on-the-spot Daniel 2 study on an interview. <laughs> and Lucas says, I can feel the hearers on the back of my back standing up in the interview and he stops and he prays and you know we kind of got into the discussion where i'm like look the reason why we're not looking for jesus to come is because we're so busy occupying until he comes and so we don't want to go home and you know, Lucas agreed. He agreed. And so I offered if he ever wants to do Bible studies, I'm available. But it was kind of cool to have that opportunity today. So, and that kind of drove what I'm speaking about this morning. Flood stories. You talk to a certain group of people and they think the story of the flood is fictitious. I remember, was it last week, Josh, the week before, we were talking about the Grand Canyon and how it may have formed, and we said it could be rapid water, right? It was two weeks ago, right? Do you know that there's over 200 flood stories globally? Are you aware of that? From the Epic of Gilgamesh to the Noah story, there is a story of a flood. Now, the details may be different. But I submit to you that if a car crash took place right in front of this church and we all saw it, there'll be different stories too. And so, it's interesting to me, right? We can't agree as a society on many things. And I jokingly say this to folks, I said, look, you know, the one thing that we seem to agree on is pork. Right? You can get Jews and Muslims agree not to eat pork. <laughs> right? Don't eat that stuff, it'll kill you. <laughs> right? There's flood stories everywhere. And the end of every week is Sabbath. It seems to be the only things that we can agree in in society. There may be more, but those are the three that I notice. So I'm going to start my story in an unusual place leading into Noah because I want to lay some foundation. Who was Noah's dad? Does anyone know? Huh? Lamech? Lamech. And who was Lamech's dad? Does anyone know? Methuselah. Methuselah was Lamech's dad. Are you aware of that? Well, if you didn't, now you know, right? Um, and so, we know that Methuselah lived to how old? 
969 years old. My wife is jumping in. It's like, 69, Collins, 969. <laughs> she doesn't play with her Bible facts. <laughs> so I want to show something first that's really interesting. Because when we study Noah's in the ark, right, we, we know about Noah. But I'm going to build up to the ark situation. So Methuselah had his first son. Um, so how I discovered this, right? Anyone do a Bible in a year? Will you read the Bible in a year? And then what happens when you're reading the Bible in a year? If you ever read the Bible in a full year and you hit the begats, what happens? <laughs> Someone said, I skip them. <laughs> it's confusion, right? So here's what I did. I did one year, I said, you know what? I paid for some genealogical software and I started to map the begats out. And I stumbled across this thing. So Methuselah gave birth to Lamech at 187 years old. If you have a pencil, you may want to write this down because it, it, it's going to, I'm going to continue to build. 187. Elisha, you're my human computer. 187, right? Then, when he was 369 years old, so 187 plus another 182, Lamech gave birth to Noah. So how old is Methuselah now? How old? 369, right? 187 plus 182, 369. I throw in math every once in a while because it keeps my boys engaged. They love math for some reason. <laughs> so after that, Moses began to preach right around the time he was right around the time he was 500 years old so how old will Lamech be when Moses started to preach 79. how much no not Moses sorry no. Methuselah Methuselah how long with Methuselah somebody said Moses you're right wrong person Methuselah how old would he have been when Mo when um when Noah, thank you, began to preach. Getting tongue-tied up here. Getting you thinking about this. Any idea? Was he still alive? Barely? Someone said he was barely alive. Wait, wait, wait. What's, that? Um, what's the number, Elisha? Did you hear that? Methuselah was 869 years old when Noah began to preach. So, Methuselah, if you read in the spirit of prophecy, Methuselah preached alongside Lamech and Noah the entire way. Anyone ever knew that? Found in the begats. Just following the begats. <laughs> Here's something else that you will know. The way to, do you know what the, in the Bible names mean something? Are you aware of that? What does Methuselah mean? His death will bring judgment. Others translate it as his death, well, his death shall bring judgment. And there's other translations, if you put the words together, man of the dark, man of the spear. But if you take the words apart, the two words, his death will bring judgment. And so the reality is, Methuselah saw the ark being built. God promised him that he would see the ark is a form of salvation, right? It's to save them. And he says... When you die, it shall come. Are you tracking that? Turn your Bibles with me. We're going to come back to that. That's just, uh, uh, we're going to come back to that. It seems unrelated, but it's related. Genesis. Genesis 6. 
I'm going to start in Genesis 1, 27. You all hang out and wait for me in Genesis 6, right? So Genesis 1, we know what happens in Genesis 1. What's happening in Genesis 1? Creation is happening. And after, uh, during the creation process, right? As God is creating this world through spoken word, first creating light, what does he say about the light? He saw that it was good, right? And then after he created the light, it was the firmament, right? The sky and the seas. What did he say? He said he saw it was good, right? And then he created dry land and he saw what? And then he created the heavenly lights and he said what? And then he created the birds and the fish and he says what? He says he saw that it's good, right? And he saw it was good. And then finally, he creates Adam. And he saw what? He saw that it was very good. Right? Right? So he, he stepped up one thing level, right? Everything he created was good. And then when he created Adam, it, he was very good. And so now we pick this up a few short chapters. So I'm in chapter one, you're in chapter six. And in chapter six, you have this unusual thing happening. It's so short, I jumped right past it. Ch uh, Genesis six, one to five, right? And it came to pass when men began to apply, uh, multiply upon the face of the earth, I'm reading from the New King James Version, and daughters were born to him, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves. They took wives for themselves of all whom they chose, right? And so we understand this is Seventh-day Adventist, right? This is people in the church are looking at people outside of God's faith, and they're coming, they look a little bit different. And so they chase after them. And the Lord said, my spirit will not strive with man for forever. What does it mean to strive? God is working now. He's trying his best to go, look, this is your passions. Chill, slow down. Follow my way. My way is the best way. Yet his days shall be numbered 120 years. So now it gets to the point where God is saying, look, the same reason why the children of Eden, um, not children of Israel, where Adam and Eve got removed from the garden was that if they kept eating from the fruit, they would be eternal sinners. And God is saying, look, man is living too long. And so he is cutting back on their lifespan because they're doing too much. There were giants in the land. Some translations would say there were bullies in the land in those days. And also afterwards, when the son of God and the son of daughters of men, and they bore children to them, and they were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord said that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent of the thoughts of heart, of his heart, was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry. Genesis 1, man is what? Genesis 6, everything is what? The King James Version says he repented that he made man. And I took time out and I looked at the word repent. And when you look at the word repent, when God repents in the biblical context, he repented that he made a Saul king. And he rem it was because there was violence and things were out of control. And so God is saying, now, I repent. I am sorry. 
that he made man, and he was grieved in his heart. Isn't that appalling? I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I made him. But, does but agree with this, um, the, the phrase that came before, or does it disagree? It disagree, right? But, there's an exception. Noah. Noah. So we all know the story of Noah and the ark, right? So I know the kids, I, I preach sometimes so the kids can get something out of it and the adults can get something out of it. So hopefully we do this, right? So we know Noah's commission to build an ark and God gives him the schematics. And so the dimensions of the ark is provided in Genesis 6, 11, just Thing, um, a few short things down and so it, it talks about a cubit anyone knows what a cubit is besides Seth I know Seth you may be studying that in school what a cubit is right um, there's some debate on what a cubit is because a cubit can be anywhere from 18 to 22 based on yeah he's nodding see I got the theologian with me but some people say that a cubit could actually be longer because man was taller back then but if we, if we use the numbers of a cubit that we understand today, the ark would have been 450 feet. And when I read these things, it, it's hard for me to imagine what 450 feet is. So 450 feet is about two football fields. 75 feet wide, and in my other notes, I actually have what 75 feet is. Um, I think it's like three quarters of the way to the top of the Eiffel Tower. Um, so it's pretty tall. And f um, wide, sorry. And then height is 45 feet, which is about a three story building. If, if you look at 18 wheelers, we all know what an 18 wheeler looks like, right? You drive past them, they're pretty scary um, thing. 800 and 32 18-wheeler wagons, cabooses, can fit into the ark. Does that help you get, uh, imagine what it looks like? 832, and that is using my conservative measurements of roughly 18 to 20 inches. Massive structure. Back in Noah's day, there is no rain. They didn't go on boats and go places. So Noah doesn't know how to build a boat. Do, do you, are you following what I'm saying? Do, which I, I noticed we don't get a ton of do in the desert, but do is the mechanism on how plants are cared for. And so, Ellen White says that it wasn't Noah's work on the ark that held the ark together. It was the divine power of God. Because he didn't know how to build boats. But now, Let's picture this for a second. Noah's building this huge structure. And he has the promise that him, his wife, and his children were going to be on the boat, on the ark. Noah preached for 120 years. How many kids did Noah have when he was given the commission to do the work? He had three? He had none. Noah had no kids. Noah, you're building an ark. For who? Me and my family. Me and my kids. We're going to be on it. But you don't have kids. When you sit down and you look at the begats, Noah's son, oldest son, comes a hundred years or 20 years 
after Noah gets the commission. Shem comes two years after Japheth, and Ham is delivered right before the flood. So now picture this. We're building a boat to save everyone. Me and my sons will be saved, and for 20 years, he doesn't have any kids. Then he has two back to back. And then the last one is coming and his pregnant wife is helping him build a boat. The world thinks he's crazy. Spirit of Prophecy says that there is many people who came in and joined with Noah. And when they saw what he was doing, they backed away and they left. There's other stuff that she says. She says that there were unions that were formed. And they were trying to muscle more money out of the project. They didn't believe in the project, so they wanted to get paid. And so now, Noah builds this ark. Genesis 7 He goes into the ark, and seven days must pass, and he's on this ark. Now, I don't know uh, Tucson really well, but I know Michigan. And anyone here ever drove past a farm? An animal farm, not a regular farm, an animal farm. Where's the animal farms around Tucson? Are there any? Okay, I'm going to use something that is a little bit more familiar because I see them all the time in my yard. Can you imagine a herd of javelinas being around? Does it smell good? Does it smell good? So Noah is on an ark. One door and one window. Doors are closed. And all of these animals are on the ark. Imagine what the people outside are thinking. This dude has lost it. Okay, so he finally got the kids, but his pregnant wife is helping with the boat. Now they're all in this unsanitary place cleaning up after animals. And it smells. And you can just imagine... People climbing to the window at the top to breathe. <laughs> we know the story. The water eventually starts to come. The angel of the Lord closes the doors. And Noah and his family are saved. But why did God put that story in the Bible for us? Why does it even matter to you? Is it just something that we read, uh, I drive stick ship still, in fifth gear, and we blow right past it? Here's this is the story of Noah. This is an easy one. This is the one we teach in Greater Road. It's good for the kids. It helps them understand God's powerful. But what does it mean to you? It is for the last days. Turn your Bibles with me. Luke 2. Matthew, Mark, Luke 2.25. I'm waiting for the pages to stop rustling. Luke 2, and behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. 
And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he will not see death before he see the Lord Christ. Who does Simeon see? Simeon holds Jesus in the temple. And his statement right after that. Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your what? Which you have prepared before the faces of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people of Israel. You didn't see what Sim uh, Simeon did? Simeon says, hey, I'm like Methuselah. Methuselah saw the ark which was salvation in the Old Testament. And he's saying, hey, look, I'm seeing Jesus, the salvation going forward. Don't you see it? The parallels, and it's the reason why the Bible always bounced back, right? There will be 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, right? Um, we're going to go 2 Peter 3, 3 to 7. I'm waiting. Now, knowing this, first, scoffers shall come in the last days. Walking according to their own lust, saying, where is the promise of his coming? And so, he's, you'll see many times in the Bible, it talks about Noah and the last days, paralleling Noah in the last days, right? So, scoffers, were there scoffers in Noah's day? Right, if you think about what I just painted for you, you'd be laughing a little bit too. <laughs> so, there'll be scoffers. Where's the promise for his coming? Where's the promise of the rain? For since the fathers fell asleep, all continue as they were from the beginning of creation. They said the same thing. So here's what happened, right? God cut lifespan short for 120, except for the select. Methuselah lived to 969, but you find that he says, I'm cutting life short to 120. And they're like, yo, things are going on just like it's all. People are dying a little bit sooner. But they rationalize it away. For they willingly forget, and by the word of God, the heavens of God, sorry, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in water, by which the world that existed perished, being flooded by water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word and reserved for fire until the end judgment. And so the ark of safety is Jesus. So you start to parallel now, right? So we have scoffers. In the ark, they found grace. In Jesus, we find what? Grace. Grace. The ark had rooms and compartments. Really popular text in the New Testament? In my father's house. Many rooms. Some translation says many rooms. There's plenty of space. That text holds a lot for me, right? Um, sidebar, quick sidebar, right? First met my wife, there was a song, and there's a mansion for me. And I was just bought a car, and you know, we were on a date, and that song came on, and my wife has tiny little feet, size five, and she's stomping her little feet in her car, and she's like, that is amazing! In his house, there are mansions! I still remember it to this day. But in both places, there's rooms. Both places, Jesus says, I am 
the door. But to get into the ark, there was how many doors? One door. We were all were invited in. Right? We were all invited in. And ultimately, the security of our salvation, just like the security of the ark, is handled by God. It says, many at first appeared to receive the warning. Yet they did not turn to God with true repentance. Haven't we seen it? There was times when churches were packed. I remember being a kid in a church in a small town called Brooklyn. We had to put down chairs because we had over 1,500 people attending every Sabbath. And now you go back, it's empty. They were unwilling to renounce their sins. During the time that elapsed before the coming of the flood, their faith was tested and they failed to endure the trial. Overcame Overcome by the prevalent unbelief, they finally joined their former associates in rejecting the solemn message. Some were deeply convicted and would have heeded the words of warning, but there were so many to jest and ridicule, and they took part of the same spirit. Resisted the invitations of mercy and was soon among the boldest and most defiant scoffers for none are so reckless and go to such lengths in sin as those who had the light but had resisted the convicting spirit of God we are called to be like Noah Amen. We are called to be like Noah. We are going to seem strange. But if we handle the light that God gives us, we can make an impact. In the conversation with Lucas, he said, Colin is a Christian. What do you think about Roe versus Wade? And I stopped and I prayed for a second. Because while he didn't understand Daniel 2, he understood that he had a problem with abortion. And I said, with my family, I'm conservative. But with others, I'm liberal. And I said, here's how I see it. Jesus says to me, I lay before you life or death. And then says what? Choose, Choose life. And I said, I am pro-choice, but I hope no one would ever have an abortion. And if they were thinking about it, and it came to me, my wife and I would find a way to help. We have a serious work to do. And being left or right doesn't even matter. Because Jesus is coming back soon. And what we need to do is find every opportunity that we can to help. 
The appeal this morning is really simple. I found an opportunity to speak to Lucas, but I know there's other times that I haven't spoken out. Who here is afraid to speak out from time to time? It's scary, isn't it? If you say something, if you say, I believe in a literal six day creation on the seventh day God rested, you are crazy. But God handles that. And so the appeal this morning is this. Who here wants to have the courage to speak boldly before others? I struggle with it too. I struggle with it too. There's times that I remain silent. And so the prayer this morning is just for that. Father in heaven, we lack that boldness. And we lack that boldness for a variety of reasons. Some of it may be we think that we don't have the answers to every question. But Lord, that's a trick by Satan because no one has the answer to every question except for you. Some of it is we're worried about being ridiculed and being made fun of to think of something as a merciful father that is looking down from heaven. But when we look at the other side, we fail to point out the insanity that we're seeing on the other side. And Lord, we ask that you give us the strength, give us the comfort, allow us to be wrapped in you and in your love. That way we are not afraid to give an answer for our faith. Lord, as we go our separate ways, we ask that this message continues to push and to trouble us until we realize that true peace only comes in you. In Jesus' name, amen.